I'm going to be presenting a summary on Israel's Navy fighter program, taken primarily from the historical, chronological perspective as the program unfolded. So to provide a little bit of background about myself, I have been a designer, structures analyst, and engineering manager for over two decades now. I've participated in the design, development, and support of jet engines for both military and commercial programs. And my past publication credits include articles in Air Force's Monthly, Combat Aircraft, Aviation History, and the Jerusalem Post magazine. The opinions expressed here are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of my employers past or present. As many of us are aware, the Israel Defense Force has a long history of modifying the aircraft and other weapons that they procure in order to meet their own specific needs. The case in point is provided by the Mirage 5. The Mirage 5 was an evolved version of the French-developed Mirage 3 that was intended to produce a more versatile air-to-ground weapons platform out of what had ostensibly been an air-to-air -air aircraft. As such, the Israelis required that additional weapon stations be added, that the weapons payload be considerably increased, and that additional internal fuel be incorporated. Deliveries, however, were suspended in 1967 following the Six-Day War due to a French weapons embargo. Israel's experience with this program, however, became the basis for the Israeli-built Nasher and later the Kafir fighter programs. Building on this experience, the Israelis proposed to the United States that they should locally produce the F-16 fighter. As initially proposed in 1977, the first 50 F-16s would have been delivered directly from the United States, with the further 200 to have been assembled locally in Israel. This proposal, however, was opposed by General Dynamics and was ultimately denied by the Carter administration. Israel's unique weapons requirements are an outgrowth of Israel's unique strategic position, which differs from that of the United States and most other major weapons developers throughout the world. Foremost among these is Israel's small size and sensitivity to casualties. This is perhaps most evident in the design of the Merkava main battle tank, which was developed in the 1970s to meet specific Israeli requirements. At a time when most tanks were emphasizing either firepower or mobility, the Merkava was emphasizing crew protection. This again was evident not only in the unique armor design of the Merkava, but also in the decision to place the engine in front of the crew, the reverse of most modern tank designs. This meant, in practice, that should an imposing shell somehow pierce the armor of the tank, it was more likely to take out the engine than the crew. Israel's small size also relates closely to Israel's lack of strategic depth, which means that Israel lies on an offensive strategy aimed at transferring the battle onto the enemy's territory and away from Israeli population centers. And similarly, Israel has no friendly air bases close to some of its far-flung adversaries from which to operate unlike the United States and others, and consequently Israel must rely on multi-role aircraft with the range to reach both near and far range opponents. Owing to Israel's small size, Israel's Air Force has been and will continue to be at the forefront of Israel's defense. Israel's population centers are all within minutes of neighboring Arab air bases. In the words of an Israeli Mirage pilot spoken decades ago, at 50,000 feet in a supersonic mirage, I can fly only north and south. Otherwise, I'd be out of the country in a matter of seconds. You can see on one side Cyprus, Turkey, on the other Iraq and Sharm el-Sheikh. You have no trouble spotting the Suez Canal, but your own country is very difficult to see. It's under the belly of your plane. You have to turn around and look back to see it. You become very aware of its smallness. The Levy was launched in February of 1980 to meet Israel's specific jet fighter needs. It was launched only after a second attempt to gain U.S. approval for local production of the F-16 was rejected. In May of 1981, the size of the Levy was increased in order to meet requirements for additional fuel and additional payload. The first prototype flew in December 1986. Again, this was a platform uniquely suited to Israel's requirements, offering 50% more payload as compared to a Block 40 F-16C 
at 20% lower empty weight. And it was designed to be more survivable, like the Merkava, with 80% larger avionics package, most of which was focused on electronic countermeasures to protect the aircraft from enemy air defenses. Now there's a considerable amount of controversy surrounding the application of U.S. military assistance funding to help develop the Levy during the 1980s. What should be remembered, however, was that U.S. involvement and in assistance for the Levy was specifically endorsed by President Reagan in November of 1983. And this was for a number of reasons. Roughly half of every Levy fighter would have been manufactured in the United States. This included such subsystems as the fly-by-wire computers, the actuators, the wings that were going to be produced at Grumman. All these were systems and components that were going to be purchased from U.S. vendors in order to save cost. Also, there was a U.S. manufacturer, Grumman Corporation, that had been contracted to produce export copies of the V in the United States at a U.S. assembly line. Now, the presidential endorsement for the Levy by President Reagan was coordinated between then Minister of Defense Moshe Ahrens in Israel and the U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz. Once President Reagan had endorsed U.S. support for the Levy, funding approval then was made through Congress through the Kemp Long Amendment in 1983, which authorized the use of already existing foreign aid dollars towards the Levy program. This, however, was opposed by then Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, who disagreed with President Reagan and with Secretary of State Schultz on this matter. Caspar Weinberger's anti-Israel bias is well known and has been widely documented. He was a proponent for suspending aircraft and other weapons deliveries to Israel at every policy turn, including after the 1981 Osirak reactor raid when Israel eliminated Saddam Hussein's nuclear weapons facility. He forbid the U.S. Navy from seeking Israeli assistance in recapturing the Achille Loro cruise ship that had been hijacked by terrorists with American citizens on board. He leaked secret U.S.-Israeli understandings to Saudi Arabia during the 1982 Lebanon war, tipping off the PLO as to their bargaining position. And of course, Weinberger's clashes with Secretary of State George Shultz were also legend. They had been rivals since the Nixon administration, and Shultz's role in securing presidential approval for Levy funding was another matter that would have made the aircraft a target for Weinberger's ire. To target the Levy program, however, Weinberger needed a surrogate, and to fill that role, he appointed Dove Zakheim. So Dov Zakheim was appointed to lead the campaign to terminate the Levy program. And that was, in fact, the terms of his reference. He was told to terminate the program, not to figure out what was the best solution to meeting Israel's defense needs, terminate the program. Zakheim was an Orthodox Jew who spoke Yiddish and Hebrew, and therefore was seen as being an effective lobbying tool in Israel. He was an accountant by training, no military background, no defense-related background. He was campaigning against the Levy on the basis of cost. During this entire effort, there was no attempt to assess Israel's military needs or how best to meet them. When Caspar Weinberger was presented with a list of alternatives that they were going to present to the Israelis to try to seduce them into eliminating the Levy program, at no time did Weinberger ask, whether or not this would be sufficient to meet Israel's defensive requirements, his concern was, how would the Saudis react? Would they be upset? In parallel with this, Zakheim also led a campaign to delay the Levy program in the United States. And he did this by ensuring that all Levy contracts were channeled through his office. And then by his own admission, he sat on them for at least a week, sometimes longer, for quote-unquote review. This policy of delay was eventually replaced by a policy of stonewall obstruction. Weinberger approved shutdown to all contract approval, which meant all U.S. contractors who had been involved in the program couldn't be paid, couldn't sign new contracts. Therefore, the program was at a standstill. This shutdown was not lifted 
until finally the U.S. Congress threatened to intervene. Even presidential censure was not enough to convince Weinberger to relent. It was the threat that Congress would intervene that finally tipped the matter. Now, within Israel, the Levy was controversial. It was controversial primarily because it was such a big program with such a large budget and therefore threatened other vital Israeli national security needs. The program had both its supporters and its detractors. Its supporters included two Israeli Air Force chiefs in succession, the chief of staff at the time that was launched, two ministers of defense in succession. However, by the mid-1980s, the tide within the Israeli military had begun to shift against the Levy. Foremost among those was Minister of Defense Yitzhak Rabin. To appreciate the economic arguments surrounding the Levy program, you have to understand that the Levy was launched in the shadow of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Following that war, Israel's defense expenditures skyrocketed. By 1981, Israel was still spending 23% of its GDP on defense. That's far more than the 6% of GDP that the U.S. spent at the height of the Reagan defense buildup, far more than the U.S. spent at the height of the Korean War. Not since World War II had the United States seen defense spending of that magnitude. It was not sustainable. When the Levy was launched, it was launched on the basis of 300 aircraft being procured. Based upon assessments in the United States by the U.S. General Accounting Office, the conclusion was that at that production level, unit cost would have been about $17.8 million in 1985 dollars, very favorable to an equivalent F-16 with Israeli avionics, which came out to around $16.9 million a copy. Not too unreasonable at all for more capability. However, as Israel's defense budget became cut in the latter 1980s, and it was realized that they could only afford maybe half as many new aircraft in the next decade or so, the unit cost went up, cutting the Levy production run from 300 to 150 aircraft would have increased unit price by about 55%. So in order to control the cost of the Levy, the only practical mechanism would have been to increase production back to 300 or more aircraft. The Levy program was ultimately canceled in August of 1987 by the Israeli cabinet in a very narrow vote that followed party lines. Twelve in favor of cancellation, eleven opposed, one abstention. In the aftermath, 4,000 Israeli aerospace workers were laid off in Israel Aircraft Industries, including 1,500 engineers. To put that into perspective, in proportion for the United States, this would have been equivalent to losing over 220,000 U.S. aerospace workers. This was a severe impact to the Israeli economy and the Israeli aerospace industry. The Israeli aerospace industry never fully recovered from the Levy cancellation. In August 1987, when the Levy was canceled, Israel Aircraft Industries employed 22,000 employees. Today, they employ just over 16,000. Israel eventually did receive a highly evolved version of the F-16 at the turn of the century, an aircraft with 50% more range than a Block 40 F-16C. However, it came with 10% greater empty weight. Fundamentally, it didn't have all of the same bells and whistles. And some of the same questions that existed during the Levy program still remain with us today. Israel has proposed evolving today's F-35, similar to how the F-16 was evolved, to produce an aircraft with greater range than the U.S. configuration that exists today. And once again, just as in the 1970s, Israeli proposals have been met with little support from the U.S. developer of that aircraft. A number of people have asked me about my experiences with writing this book and the process for writing this book. I guess I'd start by pointing out that you do not write a book like this because you think you're going to make a fortune at it. You write a book like this because you have something to say. Writing this book was a process that spanned decades. I originally 
got the inspiration for the book back in the early 1990s when I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan teaching assistant for airplane design and advanced airplane design. Got a little bit bored with some of the mundane business jet analyses. And so I analyzed Levy as a benchmark to understand the design trades that went into it. Out of that eventually came a book which I proposed to a set of eight publishers after I graduated. At that point in time, the manuscript was around 86,000 words. Didn't have any takers, did get a little bit of feedback from one of the publishers. And so, over the succeeding decade, gradually, as life happens, I added to the book, incorporated and expanded, particularly the sections on the chronology of the Levy, the politics, development history, things that I had assumed were obvious, but which I realized not everyone would have the same history and background on that I would. And when I eventually decided to resubmit it in November of 2013, the manuscript had grown to over 170,000 words. I proposed it to three publishers, signed a contract with one of them in April of 2014. However, they wanted a little shorter book, 115,000 words. Added manuscript took until July of 2014. Then they provide back the copy edited manuscript in May of 2015 and the proof copy, which is the printed version, in September of 2015. Finally submitted to the printing house in December 2015. So it is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of will, a lot of motivation and time commitment. But again, you don't write a book like this because you think you're going to make a fortune at it. You write it because you have something to say. Finally, I'm going to add a couple of words about the relationship between the author and the publisher. As a first-time author uh, of necessity, the publisher is taking a risk on you, and the terms of contract will be a little less generous than if you were a famous celebrity, certainly, uh, or if you were a author of multiple best-selling novels. However, finding a good publisher is nonetheless essential. A good publisher knows the business, how to connect to readers, how to market the book, gets the book into bookstores, and provides opportunities that an independent author using electronic-only media just doesn't have access to. So even in this electronic age, the relationship between the publisher and the author is still an important one, and I was fortunate to find a very good publisher for my book. Again, as I said, there was a fair amount of give and take on both sides. I'll just give as an example the initial proposal that I had for the title of the book uh, and a concept as such for the cover of the book, which I submitted to the, the publisher and which was then improved upon in coordination with the publisher and with the publisher's art team and marketing team to produce the finished product. So again, both the publisher and author bring something to the table. And as I mentioned before, a book like this you do not write because you think you're going to make a fortune at it. You write it because you had something to say. Thank you very much, and I hope you read the book.